Welcome to episode six of Acting for Film and TV, brought to you by Lee WTV. I'm your host, Ed Schultz. And today we're talking about auditioning 101. You've been sitting patiently and now it's your turn. They call your name and they tell you to come in. What are you going to do? You can say you can be friendly, courteous, say hello to them. And, uh, you know, any questions that they may ask you are okay. You shouldn't have all kinds of questions for them. You may have some that might make sense, but you know, how are you doing? How's your day? How's, you know, what's your favorite movie? They don't, they're not there for that kind of socializing. You're there and they are there to do a job. If they ask you a question about what projects have you been in lately, give them a short, concise answer. Don't tell them, try to tell them all kinds of stories about what happened behind the scenes and, oh, you met this wonderful actor and you had a wonderful time to, working with this particular director. Just answer their questions very simply and concisely. Now, if this is a scene in which there's some dialogue, as I mentioned before, there's going to be a reader, someone who'll stand off camera and uh, be reading the part of the other person. Now, when you slate yourself, you look at the camera. When you're doing your audition, if there's a reader, you look at the reader because that's what you're gonna be doing in the film. You're gonna be looking at another person. Very seldom in film do you look directly at the camera because if you look directly at the camera, you are talking to the audience. And that's a big no-no, generally. Sometimes it's used for dramatic effect, but that we don't even need to talk about that right now. Okay, you're doing your audition, um, or you're doing your monologue, and you goof a line. Well, don't, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, can I start over again? Just keep going. Part of that shows your professionalism. If you make too many apologize, uh, apologies for mistakes that you make or something like that, that doesn't look very professional. Everybody makes mistakes. It's no big deal. Even when you're actually doing the film sometimes, you just keep doing it. The camera keeps rolling. When they edit it later on, they can tear, take care of any kind of goofs that you may have made. Okay? So you do your audition. You do your particular scene. They may ask you to do a monologue, as I said. You do your monologue. When it's done, you say, thank you very much, and you leave. Don't ask for feedback. Don't say to them, well, how did I do? Did you like that? Now, let's, let's back up for just a moment. You're doing your, your audition, and it may be that the casting director will throw something at you that you don't expect. So be ready to improv. What do I mean by that? Well, I'll give you a specific example. Years ago, I went to an audition in which I was auditioning for the part of a sheriff who was arresting a criminal. Now, this happened to be a repeat offender, someone that the sheriff had arrested before. Fine, that's what I knew about it. That's what was in the sides. So I practiced that over and over again and, and uh, went to the audition. But then the casting director, after I did it, after I did the lines the way I had memorized them, uh, the casting director said to me, oh, by the way, this person whom you're arresting, whom you've arrested before, he's your best friend. Whoa. Okay, the dynamics have now changed. I need to instantly change my thinking, change my way. Obviously, if the person that you're arresting is your best friend, you're going to behave differently toward them than if it were just some common criminal whom you had arrested a number of times before. Different dynamic. So anytime that you can, anytime you have an opportunity 
to improve or work on your improv skills, that would be a good idea because they may throw you a monkey wrench just like the one that I was telling you about. Audition is now over. You've thanked them. You're on your way out. You don't, you know, you don't, again, you be courteous to the people who are around you, but you don't engage in any kind of discussion. You know, oh, I did a wonderful job. I thought that was a great audition. Never mind that. Just leave and go home. And remember, when you're leaving the parking lot, be courteous too, because again, you don't know who else is there. Okay, so you go home now, and what do you do? You wait. And you wait. And you wait. You don't call them to see, did I get the part? Did I get the part? No, that's a big no-no. You wait to hear from them. And here's what's going to happen. Generally, 99% of the time, if you did not get the part, you will not hear from them. They do not like to call and give you a rejection. Okay? But you need to be prepared to be rejected and not be told about it. Not necessarily an easy thing for some people to do. Just move on after that audition. Go on to whatever the next audition is or whatever, it el whatever else it is that you do with your life. Now, as a rule of thumb, I generally figure two things in terms of whether I think I'm going to get the role or not. Well, actually three. Three. And before I get into that, wait a minute. Callbacks. There is something called a callback which means, let's say that the casting director has seen 50 people. They really like three people, people in particular. You may be called back for a second audition so that they can compare you and the other top people who auditioned for that particular role. And again, it'll be the same kind of thing. Okay. So you're waiting. And you're waiting. And you're waiting. And you're waiting. Now, I generally figure that if I haven't heard in about two weeks, I didn't get the part. No big deal. Move on to the next one. Or another way that you can determine whether, whether or not you got the part is if you know what the shoot date is, let's say the shoot date is in one month. Well, obviously, if you haven't heard in two weeks or three weeks, then you didn't get the part and you move on. Now, here's a story that I'd like to share with you. I did an audition a number of years ago in July, I think it was. And uh, the director and the producer were there. I actually auditioned for two parts, a father and a son. I thought I did a pretty good job. There were some other people there who were, you know, who, who thought I did a pretty good job too. One of the reasons I say that is sometimes what they'll do is they'll have one of the actors, let's say there's, there's a, a male and a female role, and there's a female there uh, who's auditioning. They may ask her to read for some of the male actors so that they have, again, somebody to really bounce back and forth with. Well, I got some very good feedback from a female actor who was reading the lines for me because the, the producer and the director were male and they thought it would be better if the reader were a female. Okay, I thought I did a pretty good job. I went home and I waited and I waited and I waited my two weeks didn't hear anything, waited my two months, didn't hear anything. So I figured, well, okay, I didn't get either one of the roles. But wait, approximately one year later, 
I got a text message from the producer saying, Ed, we'd like you to play the role of John Sr. We're doing that. We're working on the film now. Are you available? That was a year later. Well, uh, it just so happened, one of the strangest coincidences in my life, it just so happened, I was at work when I got the text message. I was working at that time as a hypnotherapist, and I was in my office just getting ready to go home, and I get this text message from the producer. Ed, we're working on the movie. We're starting to shoot it now. Are you available? I texted back, sure, I'd be interested in playing that part. They said, okay, we're shooting in such and such a city. Can you come and see us within the next few days? Again, coincidence of coincidences, they were shooting in the same city where I had my office. They were 15 minutes away from me. So I went. Uh, I told them what the situation was. I went, I saw them, and within a couple of days, I was shooting the film. So you never know. You never know. Now, here's another instance. Um, actually, two, uh, just about, well, a year and a half to two years ago, I auditioned for a film, and I was told by one of the producers, okay, you've got this role. Okay, hey, that sounds pretty good. And this is a good size feature film. That was almost two years ago. We haven't done the film yet. I got the role, but we haven't done the film yet. Another instance. Uh, I had an audition for a smaller independent film. It was a role that I really wanted to have. Um, and I got the role. You know, the director said, on my birthday, while I was sitting, uh, being an extra in, in a really big production, I was sitting in a stadium and I get this uh, text message again from the, or an email from the director of this producer and director of this film saying, you've got the part. Okay. That sounds good to me. What a birthday present. A couple of weeks later. Sorry, um, we don't, just turns out we don't have the budget to make this film. So, the film was never made. I never played that particular part. So, you need to be prepared for disappointment because when you're auditioning, you don't know what kind of competition you have. Now, in terms of your being turned down or rejected for a particular role, and this is very important to keep in mind, there could be any number of reasons why you were not chosen for this role, and they may have absolutely nothing to do with your acting skills. Why do I say that? Well, Generally, the writer, the producer, or the, the more, more so the director, has a particular look in mind for each of their characters. If you don't happen to fill that particular look, that right away may be a reason for you being rejected, even though you may do a great job acting in that role. You don't look like the kind of person that they want. You're not menacing enough. You're not handsome enough. You're not crazy looking enough. Could be any, any one of those things. Also, let's back up for just a moment, back into that audition room as you're getting ready for this. One of the things that you want to do is to try to do something that'll make your performance unique. Something about this character that the casting director will remember. Now, when I say that, what I'm talking about is don't go over the top and do something really outrageous and crazy, because that's what they'll remember you as, somebody who's outrageous and crazy, and that's not what they want. But Think about this particular character 
and maybe some kind of mannerism that they might have, some kind of accent or some kind of way of speaking, some kind of facial expression that they might do, that's something that people might not pick up on immediately, but subliminally they may pick up on it. And it may be something that they remember. One of the things that, that, that I'm thinking of at the moment is uh, like Tom Selleck in Blue Bloods right now. This is one of my favorite shows. But he, he plays the poli a police commissioner. Tom Selleck has been known for his mustache. I have a mustache at the moment. Why do I have a mustache? I have a mustache because I have a roll coming up that I'm growing the mustache for. After the roll is over, the mustache is gone. Anyway, Tom Selleck has this strange way of, of uh, watch my face closely, strange way of kind of It's a very subtle thing. I did it ex exaggerated a little bit, but it, it, it kind of portrays, I don't know whether sometimes it's a frustration um, or, or a deliberate, uh, hmm. You know, he'll do it in those kind of moments when he's, hmm. So watch for that kind of thing. If you can incorporate something like that into your audition, it's something that keeps it memorable for that particular casting director. Okay, just a few words about video auditions. All right? This is something that we'll, we'll have another episode in which we'll talk about it even more specifically and in detail. But when you sometimes because of, it may be because of the distance uh, or, or any other number of reasons that you can submit your own video of the audition. It may be quicker and easier. It may be that if it's a small independent film, they don't have any place that they can have the auditions. So they'll ask you to self-submit a video. Just a couple of things to keep in mind. Now, you can do a video just like this. I mean, this, this whole production is done on an iPhone. Okay? It doesn't have to be fancy Hollywood uh, production equipment. It doesn't have to be fancy equipment. But a couple of things to keep in mind. As much as possible, have a plain background. You don't want anything to distract from your performance. Have a reader. You'll need someone off camera, just like they do when you're in a casting room, uh, to read the lines of the other person to you. They don't have to be an actor. They can be the lady next door. Uh, you know, they can be your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, your grandmother, anybody like that. Now, also, when you're doing a, a self-submitted video, try to make it as professional looking as possible. I had, when I was casting for my short film, Colt Navy, one person sent the most awful video that I have ever seen. Apparently he was sitting down at the kitchen table trying to do this self-submitting audition. He had probably his mother reading the lines, which was fine, but he spent most of the audition fiddling with his camera on the table trying to prop it up so that you could see him good and he was doing this while he was trying to do the doing the lines for the audition forget it right away that said to me this is not a person that i want to have in my production but here's another story about another audition for colt navy i'm going to show you in just excuse me i'm going to show you in just a moment a video of an actual audition done by an actor by the name of Scott Garin, uh, who surprised me. And I'll, I'll tell you, I want you to see this, this video first, which I thought was a good audition. Okay, anytime you're ready. My name is Scott Garin, and I'm auditioning for the role of Chief of Detectives. Well, Detective Atwell. Thanks for joining us. Sorry, Chief. First case is a detective, and you're late. Car trouble, sir. 
All right. This time, rookie. What do we have, sir? Looks like the Vic sitting on a bench. Someone walks up behind him, shoots him in the back of the head. He's wearing jogging clothes. I guess he was taking a break. Do we know who he is? Yeah, he had a college ID. His name was Benjamin Ames. Time of death? Between five and six. What would you like me to do, sir? Take a few uniforms, canvas the area. Maybe someone saw or heard something. Yes, sir. Okay, now we'll go on to the next scene. Okay, let me tell you what happened. Now, Scott did a big no-no after the audition, and he probably did it because he knew I wasn't a professional casting director. I was another actor who was making a short film, and it wasn't that big a deal. And we both happened to work for the same agency at the time. Scott came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, I really didn't, I, I, I don't think I really did a good job with that audition. And I said to Scott, hold on. I think you did a fine job. And I don't think I told them at the time, but he was auditioning for the role of the chief of detectives for the film. Now, by the time in the day Scott did his particular uh, audition, I had already sort of mentally decided who was going to get that particular role, and it was someone who had auditioned before Scott. So I knew Scott wasn't going to get that role. But there was just something about him, and this goes back to that very personal decision on the part of the director or the casting director, there was just something about him that I really liked and I wanted him to be in the film. So what did I do? I took a role that was a very minor role, and I expanded it, keeping him in mind, and I asked him to do that particular role. One of the reasons that I, I really liked that, and I liked what Scott did, we had, there was a scene, which we'll, I'll show you in just a moment, a scene in which there's an exchange between this criminologist and a, and a policeman, and most of that was ad lib. And I felt that Scott could really handle something like that because he has a very natural way about him. He didn't look like he was putting on airs. He didn't look like he was acting. He looked like this, 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 it, this was just real life. And so you never know. And, uh, uh, Officer Wolf, how long have you been with the force? About 20 years. 20 years, yeah. is that right? That's a long time. It is a long time. This is a nice place. A lot of people fish here. Yeah. It is a nice place. Terrible place to die though, huh? I think most places are terrible places to die. That's, That's a probably. nice watch you got. Oh, thank you. My grandfather gave it to me. Why? Do you, do you got a second watch there? Or? No, actually on the other end I have a 1940 Captain Midnight Secret Squadron decoder badge. Why do you have that? Pretty cool. It's cool. That's why. I collect all kinds of interesting things to put on the other end of my watch. That's great. Okay, so let's see. He was here. Oh, would you care for a fortune cookie? Uh, mm, no thanks. No? You sure? You're sure? I'm trying to cut back. Okay. They help me focus. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Hmm. From listening comes wisdom, and from speaking, repentance. Remember that. Yeah, that's... Thanks for the tip. Okay, let's see. Six feet, huh? Yes. All right. Sit up straight, if you would, please. Thank you. Head forward, please. Would you hold this right here? What am I holding That's to my a head? Piece of string. Um, right, right there. Okay. That's good. Okay, I've got a piece of string I'm holding to my head. Bang! Turn around, please. Okay. Thank you, officer. 
Appreciate your help. No problem, Professor. What a weirdo. Now the casting director may change, or if it's not the casting director, the director themselves might change their mind about the particular roles based on some of the auditions that they see. For example, there's another person who came uh, to audition for a particular role in our film, and I, after looking at him and talking to him a little bit, I said to him, "I don't want you to. I don't want you to audition for this role. I want you to audition for that role." And he got it because he was much more like the impression that I got from him. My gut impression was that he would fit this other role much better. And it was one that he wasn't even thinking about auditioning for. And he got the job. So you never know when you go into an audition room what might happen there. Okay, that's all that we have for today. I hope that you, if this is the first time you've seen uh, Acting for Film and TV, I hope you'll go back to some of the previous episodes and see what we've done. And if you have questions, particular questions yourself, about any of the material that we've covered or material that we haven't covered, I'd like you to feel free, please, to write something down in the comment section. Or you can also email me directly at actingforfilmandtv at gmail.com. And I'll be glad to answer whatever questions I can. Uh, and I also will have a, a special offer that I'd like to make, and that is for the first couple of people, first five people who contact me, uh, if you have questions about a particular role, you're getting ready for an audition, you're not sure what to do for this character or something like that, and you'd like a very short coaching session, absolutely free, the first five people to email me, that is the first five people to email me, at actingforfilmandtv at gmail.com, I will give you a free session. I'm not saying how long, but uh, I'll give you a free session in which I'll answer whatever questions I can, help you out getting ready for whatever role you may happen to be auditioning for. So that's all for now. See you in the next episode. We'll see you again on the set. Bye for now. The summer of 1960 seemed innocent enough, but for Eddie it was a time of transition. Transition from elementary school to junior high, and transition from childhood to adolescence. Although he enjoyed watching the golden age of TV and playing with his best friend Doug, this young man would be faced with tragedy and loss. Under the Pig Nut Tree by Edward L. Schultz is a charming tale, simply told in a very readable style a poignant story of nostalgia. Under the Pig Nut Tree is available from Amazon.com. And while you're there, check out the sequel, Beyond the Pig Nut Tree.